Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought <laughs> others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. Everywhere we look, television, radio, newspapers, billboards, magazines, U.S. mail, we see advertisements. Advertising is a form of communication used to encourage, persuade, or manipulate an audience, that's you, to continue or to take some new action. The advertiser's intention is to drive consumer behavior with respect to a commercial, political, or ideological offering. Commercial advertisers often seek to generate increased consumption of their products or services through branding, which involves associating a product name or image with certain qualities in the minds of the consumer. Our guest today is Mark Shoup, president of the Shoup Company, a full-service advertising company with headquarters in downtown St. Louis. Today we'll be discussing the process which goes into creating commercial advertisements. Mark Shoup, welcome to Conversation. Welcome, thank you, I appreciate it. So, little background, how long have you, how did you get started in advertising and how long have you been doing this? Well, I went to uh, University of Central Missouri in Warrensburg and I took an advertising class and I said, hey, this looks kind of fun. You know, this is back in the 70s before you knew exactly what you wanted to do. Today, parents make kids, they're focused, they know exactly what, what they want to do when they're in high school all the way through college. I took an advertising class and I asked a professor, I said, hey, do I have to draw to be in advertising? He said, uh, yeah, I think so. I said, well, I can't go into advertising. but Got out of college, uh, went to Yellow Pages for advertising, and looked for the largest advertising agency ads, and went to those advertising agencies. And the first one I went to, I got a job walking off the street with my suit on, big thick tie, and I got hired as a media buyer. What does a media buyer do? Media buyer, you uh, anytime you have a, a client and you have a product, as you mentioned in, in the introduction, that you want to sell you have a target audience and, the, and it's who you want to reach with your message, who, right. who is the, the primary consumer of that particular product. So uh, let's say soda, for example. Soda's target audience is probably teens, 12 to 18 years old. So a media buyer, if I was buying for Coca-Cola or Pep Pepsi, I would look at the target audience and see what media behavior, see what types of media that they consume and then try to get my client's message on that medium. So for example, if you're running a soda commercial, you would run on uh, like maybe Saturday Night Live, you would run on uh, maybe, maybe cartoons on Saturday morning if they still have those. American Idol. American Idol, programs that are targeted to a very young audience. So as a media buyer, you have ratings books for, for television and radio, and you look at the programs that uh, are, are the most popular with your particular target audience. And then you negotiate rates f you know, to purchase time on that on a particular medium. Mm -hmm. So that's what, what you do. You have a lot of numbers. You're evaluating ratings. You're negotiating with the stations to get the lowest rate you can for your clients. And you do that for all of your particular clients. So that's what you did in the beginning. I did that in the beginning. I worked there for two years, and then there's an agency in St. Louis, there used to be, called Darcy McManus and Macias. I remember that. They hired me back in 1980. I became a media buyer, then a media planner, then a media supervisor on Red Lobster restaurants, then on Southwestern Bell, and lastly, in Anheuser-Busch. Uh, I became, I, I, at that point, moved away from media into account service work. I was the liaison between the client and my agency and you know determine help them determine what their objectives should be and communicate that to the to the agency uh, you know to the creative department the the media the research and everybody else <clears throat> in uh and then at darcy when i was an account uh, account executive at anheuser bush my client liked the way i work and hired me so i became a brand manager on bud light beer uh, oh, for them for anheuser bush so i moved from darcy over to anheuser bush I was in Hunter Bush for seven years, and then I had an idea for Bud Light. It was a localized advertising campaign um, that at the time DDB Needham, a big agency in Chicago, was handling. And, and we were having to pay talent residuals. Anytime you're on, you're on TV, you have to pay talent. Well, we were using real beer consumers at the time. So I thought, 
you know, why should we be paying $5 million a year to, to all of the consumers that we're filming? We should do it a lot less expensively. So I went to AB management and said, you know what, this is my program. I started it. Uh, let me start my own agency and I'll do this thing and, and not have to pay the, the typical union rates. N not that there's, there's anything wrong with union rates, but if you're using real consumers, you shouldn't have to pay them union rates like they're a member of SAG or, or AFTRA. If they, were paying, they were paying the general public the, uh, the SAG rates? You have to. If the agency is a member of SAG or AFTRA or the client is a member of SAG or AFTRA, you have to pay the union rates. So we were, we were a non-union shop, although we could, we could go either way with it, but it just makes, it just makes the most sense that if we're shooting non-union people, we should pay non-union rates for that. That's interesting. You say that there was a, um, um, a young woman that I know who wanted to do, uh, this is like within the last few months, she wanted to do, learn to do voiceover work, right? Mm -hmm. And so I did a little research and there was, and I'm not gonna mention the name, but there's a company in town that teaches talent. And they also have a website, and so I went to their website and looked around, and it was strange that they had, on the website, they had male voices, female voices, union, non-union. <laughs> so you got, you got to take your pick of, uh, of various voices and whether they were affiliated or not affiliated with the union. Now, I must say, though, that we do the same thing. And for our clients, we'll look at union, non-union talent. Uh, because we're non-union, we can use non-union talent, as I said a second ago. But uh, union talent's usually better. So when you're when you are shooting a TV commercial or uh, producing a radio commercial, if it needs a higher level of talent, you need union the union mm -hmm. people because they really are traditionally better. But if it's something just very simple, maybe it's just somebody like looking saying, at mm, camera. Yeah, well, this is good. E exactly. Then non-union's fine. Mm -hmm. I, uh, um, I started out with a buddy of mine. We, we started out in radio together when we were age 13 back in <laughs> Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, then, uh, then later I moved on into television and my friend David, he stayed in radio and he became um, AFTRA and SAG and uh, made a whole lot of money. I mean, he'd go sit in a booth for 20 minutes and, uh, you know, and, and make thousands and thousands of dollars doing this. And then the business changed on him. I mean, he was competing in Cleveland with other talent from that general region. And then all of a sudden the internet came along. So now he's competing with voices from all over the country and some cases all over the world. Well, You've they, seen this change? Absolutely, the internet has changed everything. Look at, we talked about media consumption before. Um, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, early 80s, uh, y you would watch, you had four or five TV stations to watch. Now you have hundreds of TV stations to watch. And the same thing on radio, you have mm -hmm. Sirius. So the media is so cluttered, or the, market, the media market is so cluttered, uh, it's just really difficult to hone in on, on any one thing. And there's so many opportunities for, for consumers. I mean, look at Doritos. Every year they, they do the Super Bowl challenge, and they're usually the top five, you know, one or two of the Doritos commercials are usually in the top five in the Super Bowl commercials. And those mm -hmm. things, the 30, 30, three million dollars per 30 second spot. They have them produced for free by consumers. When it typically, Anheuser-Busch, for example, or you know, another like Miller Brewing Company uh, would pay, you know, anywhere from 300,000 to two million dollars to produce a 30 second spot. Doritos is basically getting it for free because you have consumers now contributing not, not just in, in, in voice, but also they're actually producing their own work now for clients. The whole process has really become easy. I remember, again, when I first started in television, uh, the days of, uh, we were already into videotape at, at that point. We were beyond kinescopes, but it was black and white. And uh, when you wanted to edit a tape, you actually physically cut the tape and had to, had to tape it. Um, and we only dreamed about having the control that, that a 13-year-old has today when he's working with uh, like Adobe Premiere or Final Cut and being able to put stuff together. They really, these uh, programmers have made it really, really easy to uh, change the nature of what used to be a highly technical business. Oh, it's, it's changed so dramatically. It's like in, in back in the uh, uh, 80s and even 90s, uh, he had to go to a production company and then to a post-production company to edit your commercials. 
Now, many agencies have their own production facilities in-house, and we do as well, because of Final Cut Pro and other, uh, and other um, editing software, you can do it better, you can do it significantly less expensively, and you can do it much faster as well. And to your standards, too. You're not depending on some third, uh, third party editor who doesn't really fully understand what you want the final cut to look like. That's, that's true, and the techniques you can use. It's just amazing, it's just amazing what you can do now. It is, but now let's go back to something you said about, oh yes, there's millions of television. It's not millions of television stations, it's actually cable TV with millions of channels on it. It's true. Called market segmentation. Right, Okay. right. How has market <laughs> segmentation changed your ability to sell commercial space? Well, we don't sell. We will buy commercial space. Right. Okay. But you know, before I uh, I talked about um, your target audience and how to best reach them. So before, when you had should have said place. place yeah, exactly. Place exactly. Space. When we had uh, when you had NBC, ABC, CBS, and then yeah. a couple of independents and the PBS right. in most major markets. You would uh, you would buy for your target audience programming period on those network stations. Mm -hmm. On NBC, for example, you would have um, you would have primetime shows, you would have early morning shows, you have late night shows, uh, midday shows, and they all they all uh, are targeted to specific audiences. Now instead of buying vertically, you're buying horizontally because on each of these cable networks you have um, HGTV, you have MTV, you have Spike, which is targeted to men. So you can be very specific and very targeted to buying specific cable networks now, or programs, not programs, but networks, versus buying you know, one CBS network and buying programs within that network. Does that make sense? I'll yes, I, I, I know what bit, you're talking yeah. about. Hopefully, hopefully the folks hopefully. out there <laughs> understand what it is that we're, that we're getting at, because your advertisers are looking to sell a product. That's the main purpose of advertising, right? They, they're trying to influence people to either continue buying Coke, McDonald's, ivory soap, whatever it is, they want them either to continue, or if they're new into the, uh, you know, they're, they're young people who've now grown up, just got married, now we have to influence them to sure. buy this product, this staid and true, you know, uh, uh, Clorox or, you know, a lot of P&G products, although I guess P&G doesn't advertise nearly as much, do they, Procter well, & Gamble? I think, they, I think they do, you just advertise differently now, but before... Well, yeah, all right, explain, because well, explain, I've read about this where it's really, they're changing the methodology of reaching the minds of those people, aren't they? Well, you mentioned digital before, and digital is playing uh, such an important part of any type of media buy now. Before, when you had, remember the four network TV stations or the three networks and the, and the independents, uh, you, you had just those and radio stations. But now you have, you have you know, the cable and then you have Sirius, which really doesn't accept advertising, but now you have the internet. And the internet can be used just like television. You can go in and purchase banner ads on various websites. So I go to CNN almost every day. So they know the CNN people know exactly who is going, what their age is, what their demographics in terms of... Pause. How do they know this? Well, they, they, well... Or how do they know it as opposed to believe it? There, there is a, a little belief, but now because of just uh, with um, uh, computer users going online, yes. they'll fill out forms, they can usually identify who you are just by going on. So you're, t the consumer's actually telling them, here's my demographic, I'm in the 18 oh, to absolutely. 25. Absolutely. I'm a male, I live in this part of the country by my zip code. It's so easy now to target consumers. Uh, they, Facebook, for example, mm -hmm. if, if you're on Facebook or if any of the viewers are on Facebook, which I'm sure most people are, there will be ads now that pop up on your page that are targeted exactly to you. They know ex exactly what you're doing, when you're doing, how much you're buying. For example, a little, this is a little off, but uh, I was in Florida over the weekend and I got a call from uh, American Express. It said, you know, hey, uh, we've got some purchases down in you know, Naples, Florida. Are, are, you know, are you, you, they know exactly 
if anything's a little off, they know exactly what you're doing, when you're doing it, and so do websites. They know, they know, they know your purchasing, they know your viewing behavior, and it's so much easier now to target and, and I don't want to say manipulate, but um, to, to, uh, to, to put a strong sales message on a consumer. Mm -hmm. And these are pop-up ads you're referring to? Pop-ups, they could be videos, there's many ways of doing it. It's, it's through social media, through, you know, we talk about Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, forums are highly targeted. Let's say that you are, uh, and I do this a lot, and I have a question about something, I go to Google or go to Ask or Ask Jeeves or something, I say, hey, how do I do this? So you have a form, and it may be, how do I get wine stain out of my shirt? Well, what they'll do is they will, um, a lot of companies will buy bloggers that will go on there and, and they will, some, now it's usually they do it, they know exactly who it is. They say, hey, I work for Procter & Gamble and you know, here's what we found to get rid of wine stains. You should use Dawn dishwater detergent or whatever. Um, so they can really target it through blogs as well, through social media. Your agency, how much of this do you, do you do and yourself of targeting and how much do you rely on them to tell you? Who is them? Them being like Facebook or, um, or cable companies to tell you, well, this is, our demo this is the demographic of this right. particular, during this particular hour on this particular channel, the demographic is. Well, they are selling something, so they will for sure communicate that to you very clearly. But you have within a, an agency, we talked about media, we talked about account service, you also have research, you also have media. Uh, yeah, the media department, we talked about that up front. Media guys, um, they have a lot of ratings, a lot of resources available to them to tell them uh, on, on uh, the internet who is doing what. So mm -hmm. they, they know what websites are targeting what consumer pretty well as it is. But then those websites will call the media department and say, hey, you know, website's really skewing towards this age. You know, you may want to look at it during this time because the, the consumption behavior will change according to the time of day as well. I'm a little older than you, not much, but I'm not a little much. older than you. And That's I remember when television was, I mean, it, was, it had good programs, you know, and it was continuously really good programs, and the programs were a draw by themselves. Uh, I remember, what was it, uh, I'm forgetting the, the year, like 66 or, mm -hmm. or 65, when the Addams Family, the Munsters, and I think Star Trek all started, like, right in the same year. I mean, I mean these are things that people are still watching now. And, but of course, programming today is really um, a lot sketchier and comes and goes. Some of them don't even last 12 programs and they're gone. I have a new maxim that says that television is now designed for one purpose and one purpose only, to hold people's attention long enough to get them to the ad. Yeah, but now you've got um, the DVRs, which makes our lives a lot more difficult and a DVR for people that don't know what it is, it is your cable receiver box that will record programs. Right. So most, cons not most, but many consumers now are uh, recording all of their programming before they watch it. Then when it gets to the commercial break, they zip or zap right through it. Right. So you know, one of the best ways and best programming uh, to purchase for media is sports, is live programming, like the Oscars, like the Emmys, like, you know, Super Bowl, baseball games, because people start at the beginning and they watch the entire right. thing. You're not going to record it and watch it later because you know the outcomes, right. what it's going to be. And you talk about how the quality of programming and, uh, and the actual shows are diminishing. That's true, because think about uh, before, in, in the old, I keep talking about the old days, and you know, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, you, had, you had the the networks, and they had all the viewers in the in the entire country, in the entire world, coming to those four networks and those programming. So they had a share of like of the of the television viewing audience, a hundred percent of the viewers watching TV are tuned into those four stations. Well, right. now you've got hundreds and thousands of stations, and the share of even the networks like CBS, NBC, ABC 
are significantly diminished. So they don't have the ad revenue coming in that they can then afford better production, better stars. So it's, it's very difficult for them too. They are not as profitable as they once were. That's why you see a lot of them becoming involved in, uh, in, uh, in digital and you know, buying AOL and Times Warner and you know, uh, uh, is it CBS, it's owned by um, General, Electric, General Electric, right? I think it's NBC. N it? NBC, NBC. one of them. So they're very diverse now. When they used to be just TV, now they had to diversify. Right. Yeah, um, I, I, <laughs> I'm just thinking back. <laughs> <laughs> there was a time when the President of the United States, when he went on the air and wanted to talk to the nation, if, if you were watching television, you were watching the President of the United States or you weren't watching television. And what you've just said, and I think people, people understand, that, although they may not realize it consciously, that there are so many other places to go now. There, there is no, television used to be like a national forum, a place in which there was a common, rich, shared experience. Uh, hmm. When there, there was a series, and I'm forgetting the name of it, but you may remember this, when there was like this series about Japan, and the guy who played, Do uh, Richard Chamberlain, uh, played in this series. Right. And I can't think of the name of it, or uh, Shogun. I was gonna say Shogun. Yeah, right. Shogun, and, uh, and then there was another series uh, about the African American experience with a character, you know, Kunta Kinte. Americans, roots, roots, roots right. right. I mean, Americans shared in this. America became Japanese for a period of time. America shared in the African American experience during the period when Roots was on. I don't see that anymore. I th you know, it, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's not yeah. such a good thing that we are now so market segmented. We are, and just think about uh, how we used to, used to, you know, if the president was on or Adam's family came on, the whole family was congregated in the living room, all watching Their the, TV, the TV tables. together, <laughs> right? With, you know, with TV dinners on it. Now think about now, it's, if you have two kids and it's you and your wife, if it's just you at home by yourself, at least for me, I'm sitting there on the chair, I've got my laptop on my lap, I've got my iPhone on, on the, the handle, I may have an iPad over here, I'm watching TV, I'm doing all these things, and I'm not as good as the, the teens today. I mean, these kids, they multitask like you've never seen before. Right. And if now on a typical prime time night, your family's probably dispersed through the house, you have you know, the wife, and I was gonna say in the kitchen, but people would shoot me for that, the wife's in the, in the living room watching TV, you may be in the bedroom, your kids are upstairs, everyone's, consuming media differently and consuming the media they want to watch. There's, there's no arguments over remote controls because everyone has their own resources available to them. So this makes it more difficult for you as a, as a purchaser of advertising time for customers who want to sell products to people. Or, or does it? Or, oh, uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe significantly more difficult. Maybe you're saying that, that the places that you're going are in fact telling you, if you want to sell this kind of product, here's the time slot to put it in. No, because you, you know before you had six available, six available medium or media for you. You had, you know, a few TV stations. You had a few radio stations. You had newspaper, print, outdoor. Now you've got hundreds and thousands of of media available to the consumer. It is so much more difficult now because the, it's so dispersed over so many di different types of media. It's really, before, you always, in, in media, you talk about reach and frequency. You wanna reach X percent of your audience X number of times. Mm -hmm. the, the effective, I think this still holds true today, but the effective minimum frequency level is three, which means usually takes three times to get the to, to get the consumer to remember your ad and to actually see it to, to see it and <laughs> right. remember it and digest it right uh, it's probably a little higher now um, because it's dispersed over so many different types of media but it's just so much more difficult now than than what it used to be we got about three or four minutes left okay. here to the end um, one of the I was doing some research before <laughs> I came on here although we're not really talking about this stuff that that I had looked up but one of the things that I found that I, was interesting is that back in 1925, advertising consumed 2.9% of GDP. Move up to 1998, 
it's about 2.4 percent of GDP. In other words, advertising same, really does, is, has stayed flat, although there's more people and a much larger GDP. And same amount of dollars, proportionately, and it's, again, it's dispersed over thousands versus a few. Yeah. So it's, it's so much more difficult just in terms of profitability for the companies. The, the profit margins aren't nearly what they used to be. No, not like, uh, like that TV program, Mad Men, shows these guys living a pretty elegant lifestyle. I don't know whether, as an owner of a business, you live an elegant lifestyle like some of those guys. Not, not. like those guys. Um, in the, usually in the last couple of minutes I say, is there anything important we haven't covered? And I turn it over to the guests. Is there anything that you wanted to say or put forward that we haven't talked about yet? I, I don't believe so. It's, um, it, you know, again, it's the, the uh, times have changed and they will continue to change. I'm really curious about what's going to happen over the next 10 years and 20 years and, and where media is going to go. I remember as a young media buyer, Darcy McManus and Macius, uh, this is back in the early 80s, they, they uh, said, would you do, me, do us a favor and do a white paper on cable and how that's going to affect media behavior? And I, you know, I'm a 23 year old punk and I said, you know, I, I don't know what's gonna happen. I Should've called me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and look at it today. So what's gonna happen in the next 10 to 20 years? I always say, I did a, a presentation a couple of weeks ago on, on predicting the future. I say, you know what, it's hard to predict the future. If you want to predict the future, create the future. So that's what we as advertising agencies try to do. That's interesting. That's an interesting philosophy right there. And yet, you know, I guess traditionally people have always tried to influence their friends and neighbors and uh, to do one thing or another. And that's your business, isn't it? Is, is just to influence friends, neighbors, people you never met into doing, buying, behaving in a certain way. Absolutely, and that's, uh, you know, and I love my job, I love what we do. There's nothing I enjoy more than driving down Highway 40 and seeing outdoor boards that we've created or watching TV and seeing commercials that we've created. I really love what I do in the industry and I, I can't wait to see what happens in the future. Well, I don't know if you do political commercials or not, but my wife's very unhappy <laughs> with political commercials. Because uh, of mean, the negativity. It, it's all negative. It's I all mean, negative. There, there doesn't seem to be any sense, uh, and we don't have any time to go into this, perhaps another time, um, of what is it that, you know, the vision. I, I don't see it in, in the political realm. I don't see any vision being presented in any of these commercials. It's just, you're worse than I am. Well, th that's, I would love to talk about that. That's in a whole new program, and I love yeah. political advertising, and my wife's a politician, and I, I really, really enjoy doing it. Well, we'll have to have you back. Let's Thank you very it. much for being you with us. You bet. And to my audience, I've been speaking with Mark Shoup, who is the uh, president, and I believe owner, of, uh, of the uh, Shoup Company Advertise, a full-service advertising company in uh, downtown St. Louis. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed this, uh, this little half hour uh, talking about advertising. For those of you who thought it was interesting and would like to see it again or show it to your friends, we're on YouTube. Go look it up, Lee Presser or Conversation with Lee Presser. Thank you. Goodbye.